And so today we have the first DH colloquium um, of the year, 2023. And I'm very happy to have here uh, Thea Pittman. She is a professor of Latin American studies at the University of Leeds in the UK. Um, her research focuses on, on Latin American digital cultural production with a particular interest in questions of race, uh, ethn ethnicity and gender, as well as the intersection with environmental humanities. Um, so this is a presentation together with Janice Watson, um, it's a little bit unclear if she can make it because she's traveling at the moment. Um, hopefully she will be able to make it. Um, she holds uh, the leadership chair for language at Leeds at the University of Leeds and is a co-director of the Center of Endangered Languages, Cultures and Ecosystems uh, and a fellow of the British Academy. Her research interests lie in modern South Arabian and Yemeni Arabic dialects with particular focus on uh, theoretical, phonological, and morphological approaches. So I think that sounds like a very nice mix of interesting topics. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over the, the, the virtual floor to you, uh, Thea. Right. Well, thank you very much um, for that introduction. I'm uh, Yes, Janet isn't obviously here. Uh, she's in Oman. Uh, she tells me that she's not in the back end of the desert anymore, um, but somewhere where she might manage to connect, but clearly she hasn't managed to do so just yet. So I get to play Janet for the first bit, um, which is really briefly just to tell you um, just a couple of lines about the, the centre that we've set up. We set it up possibly, it was before Covid, <laughs> that's how I date things now. Um, so it was about four, four or five years ago that we set it up. Um, it is, uh, so it's the Centre for Endangered Languages, Cultures and Ecosystems. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary research centre at the intersection between arts and humanities and the STEM subjects. Um, so we have members, we've got about 19 members in the centre and whilst a large proportion are based in our school um, and are linguists, um, it's not only the, the hardcore linguists that are part of it, um, and um, yeah, we have members in earth and environment um, and uh, other parts of the university. Um, uh, it, apparently, it is the only centre in the UK concerned with the parallel conservation and documentation of languages, cultures and ecosystems, their symbiotic relationships and the potential economic and environmental impact of their loss. Um, and it really, we're very small at the moment. Um, I think we've done quite a lot considering um, you know, we don't have admin support and, and so on and so forth. And we are angling uh, to see how we might grow uh, so that we really can um, do all the things that we'd like to do. Um, I am a kind of a bit player in, in the Centre for Endangered Languages, Cultures and Ecosystems. Um, I, um, I've been in there since the beginning um, and, um, you know, as a I think as a critical friend, uh, because I'm not a linguist, as you'll have seen from the, um, the introduction, um, I work in uh, digital cultural studies. Um, and I, yes, uh, I, I can't quite do the, the whole trio of languages, cultures and ecosystems, but I am interested in environmental humanities, for example. Um, so, so they let me stay and play. Um, so that's that's what I can tell you about the centre um, for now. Um, Jan, Diane, uh, not Diane, uh, Janet hasn't managed to join in the meantime, has she? Um, so I think um, we should we should move on. And if um, she does manage to join us, then perhaps um, she can talk and you can ask her some more questions about it um, at the end. Um, so um, yes, I hope I'm not going to disappoint anybody by uh, not giving a talk that is remotely related to linguistics, um, but I will share my screen and you will soon uh, see what it's all about. Um, so we're going to do that. And then uh, I'm going to do a slide share. Hopefully it's going to do its thing. Yes. OK. So playing green games, Misha Cardenas' Sin Sol No Sun, uh, which 
you could also um, play. So I'm interested in uh, video games. Um, my children think this is utterly ridiculous because I don't really play video games and spend most of my time complaining about uh, other people playing video games. Um, but I am in interested in them um, because of their reach um, and because of the way that they can impact behavior. Um, and I'm interested in green games. So, you know, the, the ones that um, are interested in that relationship with the environment. Um, so, um, in terms of their, their importance, um, Scott Retberg, whilst writing about a, a slightly separate topic, which was electronic literature, says that uh, computer games offer the most predominant, um, predominant, I'm just trying to move, that's it, the most predominant form of storytelling in contemporary digital media. And they've provoked some of the most developed thinking about the potentialities of computation for narrative, interactivity, and multimedia. Um, and he also flags up their potential for modeling ethical choice and moral complicity. Um, I haven't filled my slide with loads and loads of stats about how many millions of people play computer games and how many more millions uh, watch um, videos of other people playing them and how they've become a, a sport in them, their, their own right and all the rest, but I'm sure you have an idea. Um, so the, the area that I'm most interested in is um, what gets called serious or persuasive, sometimes educational games. And within that, a sub, subset called art games, um, a, coin, a term that was coined in 2003 by Tiffany Holmes. Um, so art games tend to appropriate the most popular genres of computer gaming, socio-political critique, or they eschew the mainstream and highly competitive game genres and encourage the player to appreciate them on aesthetic terms, to experience them as art. Um, and I like um, the, the game that I'm going to talk to you about is in this sort of second uh, bracket, not, not doing a, a sort of a spoof mainstream genre, but um, in, encouraging you to experience things as art. Um, and as they do that, they're focusing on generating feelings, affect, um, and you know, as, as they move you emotionally, they might also move you to action that um, happens in the real world beyond the game space. Um, hence uh, why they might be useful if we want to talk about uh, the environment, the state it's in, and um, the way that we all might need to change. Um, so within, within this um, field, um, you get genres um, which are kind of all about exploring a space. You explore the game space. Um, sometimes they are called walking simulator games. Um, sometimes they're referred to as environmental narratives. This doesn't mean that they have to be about the environment, um, but um, it is the, the, the nature of video games um, and their sort of use of space, that means that um, environmental questions per se are um, important within them. So um, Philip Pennick Tadson, who's written a whole book about uh, computer games with respect to Latin America, cultural code, says video game space is an environmental context for the active creation of culturally contextualized meaning. Um, Green games, as in games that are specifically about the environment, um, we, we can see that computer games would be um, very suitable for that, given their environmental structure. Um, but the, the total number of green games per se is uh, fairly modest. Um, you can, of course, produce an eco-critical critique of any game, um, Alenda Chang has got a wonderful book called Playing Nature. Um, I've missed out the, the subtitle, but it's all about how video games per se um, address uh, environmental uh, questions. Um, and she does say um, that um, while the design of game environments continues to grow more computationally and graphically complex, they all too often rest on relatively simplistic environmental models. 
um, such as resource extraction or visual spectacle. Um, we all think of you know, things like Minecraft and all those games that are about either collecting stuff or extracting stuff um, and, and or destroying things. Um, but um, as Woolbright and Oliveira tell us, um, all games have the potential to generate ecological themes, creating dynamic interactive player experiences involving environmental arguments and ethics. Um, and what I've given you at the bottom is um, Woolbright and Oliveira's set of research questions, which I think are pretty useful. Um, how do ordinary and game worlds intersect and what are their ecological repercussions? How do their narrative and mechanical designs affect our environmental imaginations? What messages about environments might we carry from games into our ordinary wor worlds and vice versa? Um, and it's in that area that I am interested in trying to answer a few questions. Um, so there is the game that I want to um, talk to you about um, is um, it's a it's a mobile game. It's a, an app available on iPhone and iPad um, that uses augmented reality. Um, and some of my thoughts, therefore, about the, the relationship between game and world, the, world, the real world and our environment um, that relate to, you know, the, the, this setup and what you get out of it. Most of the discussion about video games presumes that they are virtual reality things that you, you know, you experience in a darkened room um, with your games console. Um, and there has been a huge amount of discussion about, you know, immersivity, um, the all encompassing nature of the sensory experience afforded to the user through that technology. Um, arguably, there has been too much attention paid to it. Other people who want to talk about the same thing uh, talk more readily about a user's sense of embodiment or presence in a virtual reality environment. Uh, so the range of sensory stimuli used and how the user interacts with that environment. Um, and um, I think it's, it's important, hence picked out in um, blue, that um, these multi-sensory embodied experiences in virtual reality can significantly affect our pro-environmental inclinations and results of behavior. Um, it's not just within the field of video games, obviously, that people are interested in the, the potential of VR and uh, gamified environments to, uh, to affect our pro-environmental uh, inclinations. Um, when I first started doing this research, uh, it was a talk by someone who was doing a PhD in Earth and Environment at the University of Leeds that sort of put me on this track of you know, the amount of interest that um, was being dedicated to that. Um, so, um, so much for virtual reality. What difference does augmented reality make? So augmented reality works with layers. It doesn't attempt to suck up 100% of our attention, um, but to uh, sort of infiltrate a digital layer um, between us and the, the world that we can see beyond um, through uh, the, the camera, the viewfinder um, of our device. Um, so in augmented reality, the user's sense of embodiment is going to be complicated between shifts of a sense of embodiment in the virtual world um, and also in their real surroundings. I mean, arguably, with virtual reality as well. You never stop being a real person and you might feel hot or cold or hungry and stuff. Um, but it's it's arguably more important uh, in relation to augmented reality. Um, you might be, um, yeah, you might be um, outdoors or indoors or, you know, uh, in danger. So there's, there's much more uh, to, to sort of bear in mind. Um, and also um, you can perhaps draw on a wider range of uh, the senses in this kind of context. Uh, in other research that I was reading, uh, you know, of people using augmented reality apps, um, you know, smell and touch, uh, and the, the physical, you know, sensations of um, 
being hot or cold or wind or whatever um, were as important as the senses that tend to be drawn on in virtual reality uh, of visual and uh, auditory um, stimuli. Um, augmented reality is most often used with locative technologies or locative technologies. Um, so, you know, um, stuff that's going to identify a particular geographical location. Um, so it's, uh, this is on mobile devices um, and this is going to be used to enhance our appreciation of specific sites and landmarks. Um, you know, the endless apps that there are of, you know, central London or Paris that you get on the tour bus and you go around with and uh, as you go around and you look at things through your viewfinder, it tells you more and, and or, um, you know, takes you back in time to what Big Ben looked like, um, you know, 100 years ago or whatever, or the, the, the Eiffel Tower. So that's, that's then one of their primary applications. Um, and um, Bolter uh, and colleagues, uh, J. David Bolter and colleagues, uh, have talked a lot about uh, the way that what they're doing uh, is um, sort of trying to um, recreate and enhance the aura of those kind of recognisable landmarks uh, based on our shared sociocultural understandings of um, the, the landmarks and what they mean and their importance. Um, the mobile game that I want to look at with you uh, uses AR, but without these locative technologies, um, but with a kind of with space and motion sensitive technologies. Um, so it, it sort of does away with um, anything about specific landmarks. You're simply dealing with everyday space. Nothing, you know, the your your environment wherever in the world that you happen to be. You're not tied to only being able to use it in central London. You can play it anywhere. Um, and having stripped away then the, this, um, you know, the official kind of aura based on such shared socio sociocultural understandings, my argument is that you um, are left with a much more personal, effective response um, that is triggered by the combination of digital and real materials that you get. Um, so aura shifts from being something that um, games designers or, or app designers can you know, program in advance to, to enhance or create. Um, and you, you kind of, you, you choose your own aura. Um, it's much more contingent on exactly where you are. Um, and I think that's where the, the environmentalists, the green game kind of thing comes in. Um, and the one thing that I should have included on the slide and I haven't is that Aura, obviously, the person who's written most about it was Walter Benjamin. Um, and what I like about what he did was that his very first definition of aura was actually a kind of an eco-poetic um, definition. So he said, you know, aura is the that that special um, sense of um, something that you're looking at, um, where where you sort of you, you frame it in your mind's eye um, and you sort of, you, you sort of, yeah, set up by, by framing it in your mind's eye, you set up a distance. And his example was you're lying on, you know, on a, a, a grassy bank on a summer's day and you're looking off at mountains in the distance or the shadow that's cast over you by a tree. Um, and that's, that's your perception of aura. It's, it's a, you know, what he was describing was a natural environment and he was talking about the fact that you sort of breathe it in you perceive that specialness yeah, and obviously anything that you choose to look at and appreciate in that sense can have aura so we're it's not about you know uh, this is an important work of art or this is an important landmark and therefore you need to pay attention to it okay um so the person that i uh, want to talk to you about is misha cardenas um, she is a uh, Latina uh, performance artist and uh, sort of tactical media artist. Um, she has worked with the Electronic Disturbance Theatre in its later iterations. The Electronic Disturbance Theatre 
were most famous originally for um, creating um, a Java applet uh, called the Zapatista Floodnet tool that um, did denial of service attacks on um, you know, uh, the World Bank and uh, the Mexican Stock Exchange and stuff in support of the Zapatista uprising that took place in Mexico in 1994. Um, so very much um, sort of yeah, hacktivist uses of tech. Um, they also did, uh, and this is where Misha Cardenas comes in, this uh, transborder immigrant tool project, uh, which nearly got some of them put in jail, uh, or at least got them to uh, lost them their jobs in academia. Um, so they were creating um, um, an app for very cheap mobile phones that was going to help people uh, find water sources in the desert as they were crossing from Mexico over into the United States. Um, and they were providing eco poetry with it as a sort of an added extra. Um, so that's the kind of background. Uh, she is based at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, and she is in media and games design. So moving on, um, I'm going to see if I can play you this little uh, snippet of SinSol so you get very quickly an idea of what it is. Um, it is a, a game for iPhone or iPad. Um, it's definitely, it's an art game and it's a green game and it uses AR. Um, so let's see. Hello. 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 I. 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 Am so happy you are here. It worked. I. Am here to tell you how the sky died. How those who traveled across borders and built homes here could only run to the ocean for fear of ice agents at the shelters. How I coded my own body at the soil. How I escaped the bright orange wall of the region eyes that turned to the sky. Okay, so you, you've had it really. Um, I will talk some more about. Right. Um, so what I want to do for the remainder, and I'm just grasping for my phone to make sure that I am uh, going to be within time, yes, um, is just show you a few uh, slides that I took whilst I was playing the game and some reflections on, you know, my first uh, reading of the game, uh, sort of, um, you know, as I um, found out what it did for me for the first time, and then subsequent kind of, um, more deliberate um, attempts to play the game um, where I, um, yes, effectively seek out my own aura. Um, so um, I think, I mean, obviously you could do different things, but if you're me, you sit at your computer and think, okay, well, I, this looks relevant. I think I need to pay attention to it. I, I'll just download it and open it and see what I can do. Um, and the first thing that you realize is that the game environment, yes, opens it up in itself up in front of you, um, stretches out across your, your room, um, and, and that's it. Nothing much more happens. You can move around, um, twist in your seat, and have a look one way or another to see if anything happens, but nothing is going to happen unless you get up out of your seat. You know, it takes 10 seconds, really, for you to realize that the basic premise is that you have to get up. Um, you have to move towards these objects, the, the plants on the floor uh, or the dog that you can see um, to, to make something happen. So, um, yes, OK, um, before I get that far, effectively, I did get up out of my seat. I quite quickly got stuck up in the corner by the door. Um, I then tried playing it in the corridor, down in the kitchen. No space was big enough. And the basic conceit of the game is 
Uh, it's not about winning anything. It's the fact that you have to go outside and play it, um, as Karnas says. Um, there is no internal space. I mean, maybe at a, in a sports hall or something like that, you might find enough space just about. Um, but within most people's uh, environments, uh, built environments, you're going to have to go outside, um, which is uh, one sure way to um, change this dynamic of playing computer games in darkened rooms. Uh, and make us appreciate uh, or, you know, in interact in some way with um, an external environment, whether it's natural or not is another question. So I did uh, go outside. Uh, this is me um, messing around in the park um, by my house. Uh, I put myself on Strava so I could uh, record the erratic movements I made around the park. Um, the one thing that you notice is that even, you know, this is where my house is, so I set out from there. And very quickly, even then, in an outdoor space, I kept getting stuck against the edges of the park in the hedges. Um, so it's it's set up to require a lot of space. Um, moving on, um, you've seen this. You've seen um, how the basic game play works. Um, you move towards the plants. Um, this is um, Aura. 2019, an AI hologram um, who um, is talking to us. It's set in the future. It's set kind of 50 years into the future at a point when a UN report that Kavanaugh had read said that our environment would have completely collapsed. Um, she has survived the end of human civilization by becoming this hologram um, and um, is delighted that somehow we, the game players have made it through um, to the other side and can, she can talk to us about what happened, about how, how the planet died. Um, and about also her particular sort of intersectional uh, vulnerabilities uh, in this sense as a, as a woman of colour um, and in, even more specifically as a trans woman of colour. Um, so you move around, you, you approach each flower. As you do, um, the, the AI hologram appears in its particle swirl uh, and performs what you see as the, um, the text hanging um, next to each flower. There's no specific order. Um, you can go round and round in circles for as long as you like. You tend to stop when your arms start aching. Um, most, I, th I think most art games don't uh, take more than about an hour to play. Um, and I don't think I had played it for more than half an hour at a time before my arms did start aching. Um, what I think is interesting is that, of course, um, you know, once you're out, outdoors, um, you're perhaps, um, you're, you're dealing with a different set of circumstances to, uh, to playing a game indoors in a fixed position. You're not necessarily always safer in your own home. I would grant you that. Um, but outdoors, um, if you're going to play this game outdoors, uh, despite you can see the real world around you through your viewfinder, but, you know, arguably you're less, you're, you're not 100 percent aware of your real environment because you're paying attention to a digital environment at the same time. Um, you want to think about whether you want to play it, you know, uh, near a busy road or near a cliff or after dark and things like that. So um, I think there are, you know, and there was, there was dog poo in the park and there were nettles and I kept getting stuck in the, the bits where the nettles were. And that dog in the park uh, didn't much like the look of what I was doing. Dogs can be very suspicious of, of people doing odd things. Other people, you know, occasionally with passers-by, it's a, a reason to uh, start a conversation um, and you could, then perhaps be doing what the game wants you to do, which is talking to people about, oh, I'm playing a game about climate change. Um, but equally, other people, uh, particularly by the children's playground, um, were perhaps suspicious that I was taking photos, recording their children um, and things like that. So there, I think what's going on is that um, the, by being outside, there are a whole different sort of set of considerations of vulnerabilities um, and the vulnerabilities that this specific AI hologram uh, flags up of being, you know, um, 
potentially an illegal immigrant, a person of color, uh, a trans person, um, then you know you you you're comparing, contrasting, um, and um, experiencing that heightened sense of vulnerability. Um, Aura did keep getting stuck in the bars of the children's playground. Um, so once I got the hang of the game, I then decided to start um, pushing it a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I, I was aware that it was asking me to look at my local environment and to think about it. Um, and the one place that I, I just, it, it was the time of year. Um, you, can, you, you can't tell that this was high summer from the picture, but this is high summer in the north of England. Um, this was the summer solstice. Um, and some of us like to go up and hang around by the standing stones that are on top of the local moor. Um, so, you know, this is, the, the game led me to um, wanting to use it in an environment where I, I perceive that there is uh, an aura to it already. Um, but it wasn't that that I thought was most uh, important. Um, but actually, as I swirled, uh, you know, sort of moved around, even up on the moor, uh, there wasn't enough space to completely play the game. Uh, I could have carried on forever. Um, but the moor uh, is also completely um, stripped of vegetation. This is apparently the way we think our moors should look. Um, they should look, you know, just kind of trimmed down heather and suitable for grouse shooting. Um, but one of the elements in the game is this screen of Pacific Redwoods, um, which was always quite an odd element to the game, and I was never quite sure about what it was really doing. Um, but suddenly, up at the top of the moor, that screen came into play, and it presented itself to me uh, in a way that most impactfully said, that's what's missing up on this moor. This is, you know, the trees have gone. This moor could be covered in trees. And it's only because of, you know, the way that we have become used to living in a completely sort of stripped, uh, and, and uh, I mean, Georges Monbiot says that, you know, there's, there's less uh, biodiversity up at the top of the moor than there is in a Tesco's car park. Um, he's possibly right. Um, so I thought, you know, for me, this was, this was impactful. Um, and um, I think that's pretty much where I want to leave it. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Um, you can find it on the, uh, the App Store if you happen to have an Apple um, device. And I will uh, stop screen sharing. Great, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. I thought it was actually pretty cool. This is quite different from uh, most of the presentations that we've had. So this is really like a fresh uh, view of something digital, digital humanities like. I'm um, not sure if there are any questions. I don't see any questions in the chat, but perhaps people have some questions. Or people are thinking of questions. You can just unmute yourself. We're a relatively small group. I mean, I, I've got a few comments. So I, I didn't fully realize it, even though I read the abstract and, and everything, um, I, I didn't really know what, what, what to expect. But this very much um, uh, aligns with um, work done by a PhD student that I supervised who graduated last year in, I think it was October or September. Um, she's originally from Colombia. Uh, and she was very much interested in developing kind of virtual reality and augmented reality games for um, teaching about environmental issues. Uh, so she developed um, a system called Justin Beaver. Um, so, and, and we tried out different things. So you can be the beaver or you can see the beaver in virtual reality. So she was really looking at what, what, what you said. So the sense of embodiment and, and presence. So we didn't so much look about the um, a, a look at the kind of effects of the, the teaching part. It was more like, how can we make the most kind of impact? How can we get the, the, the most, um, yeah, I'm not sure what the right word is, well, like, like presence to make the most impact in the, in the mm -hmm. teaching. Um, and mm -hmm. I thought it was actually really nice. We didn't we didn't get to the um, environmental issues in the end. Um, 
she is now also looking at using tools like a HoloLens where you can actually have like a hologram in your room, for example, and then looking at the size of things. You also mentioned size of, you know, the, the, the game space. Mm -hmm. uh, she's then also looking at the different types of interaction. So getting artificial intelligence in there and what kind of effect that has. Um, so I thought it was actually really cool. Um, uh, I think you need to give me her name. I, I uh, okay, so that's Alexandra Scher. I can, I can give you a link as well. Yeah, or, or put me directly in touch with her because exactly. yes, it yep. sounds so like she that's... is absolutely someone I would like to talk to about. <laughs> yeah, so she she really wanted to go into that our environmental issues teaching about. So it was really children or people in living in a city don't know what it's like in a jungle, and there's mm -hmm. no you don't have a link, so you don't have that. You, it's difficult for you to see what kind of impact um, in you know getting. Uh, wood from the jungle has because there's no sense of what it means um, mm -hmm. but we didn't get that far okay um, yes no uh, I am working together with um, another colleague down in Bristol who um, is creating games at the moment for a project that he's doing uh, relating to race in Brazil um, and um, yeah we would very, very much like to talk to that um, ex-PhD student of yours um, because, yeah, using, I use this game in the classroom um, alongside a few others. I know that my teaching is successful when I've lost all my students because they've all gone outside. <laughs> um, but yes, it would be really, really, really good to share um, stuff with her. And we can probably tell her about some other games that exist. Um, and I'd love to know about what she's done and see see examples of it. Cool, wonderful. So I'm not sure if any other people have questions. I don't want to hog the <laughs> whole presentation. I don't see any questions yet. Um, and then sorry, I'll just continue. Okay, no. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, I was actually saying, yeah, um, this is a really, really interesting for me as well, as I experienced a similar uh, presentation in Tilburg when I traveled on my trip lately with uh, masterminds. So yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Thank you so much for this. Cool, yeah. So I can quickly say something about that as well. Um, so in Tilburg, Tilburg University, they have the Mind Labs um, kind of organization. And part of that is um, a group working on virtual reality. So I'm not sure exactly what they do now. It's been a few years since since I worked there. Um, but they also looked at the effects of virtual reality um, and, and serious gaming as well. So that might be mm -hmm. another uh, link. That's what, what Jessica was just talking about. Excellent. OK, yes. I mean, all of this, I will definitely follow it up because, um, I mean, all I can talk to you, and this is why my kids think I'm ridiculous, because really, I only play this one game or maybe a few. But um, I need to, yes, kind of expand. I've done my best uh, to, to bring in the things that I think are relevant to, to allow me to interpret what I've got here. Um, but there is other stuff going on and I want to know about it. And particularly, you know, how we use this stuff in the classroom. Mm. Yeah. Um, OK, so, so I have another question. And so please interrupt if others have questions as well. So I was really wondering how this game kind of relates to something like Pokemon Go or Ingress, um, which are all, which are more kind of lo location-based, right? So you need yes. to go to a particular place to do something. And this is exactly not that. You can do it anywhere, but then yeah. within the game. It's, so so how, does that, how does that relate? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's really interesting precisely because of that. I have read... Um, articles about Pokemon Go as played in Rio, uh, for example. And Pokemon Go, because of the way it's set up and it being location-based, um, all of those locations tend to be in urban environments. Um, so for kids playing games who aren't in uh, urban environments, it's a complete dead loss. Um, so I think in that respect, it can be uh, interesting um i would have loved it if they had created this also for android um i think having created it only for apple is a mm. real limiting factor 
Um, I work with indigenous communities in Brazil and uh, well, virtually all of, uh, you know, every family has a mobile phone, um, if not one per person, um, but it doesn't tend to be an Apple model. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, so about Pokemon Go, I know that at least in the Netherlands, there was a situation where one of these, I can't remember what they're not called, um, training stations or whatever they yes. were called, where you needed to go to collect the, uh, the animals, uh, was actually in nature. And there were so many people going there that they destroyed the environment. So that's uh, okay. <laughs> so that's perhaps the reverse of what you would like yes. to, um, yes. to get. Well, yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And um, yeah, I mean, Pokemon Go as well has its, you know, the, its embedded dangers. I mean, if you're in Latin America in an urban environment, I would not want my kids playing Pokemon Go. Mm. Um, you know, I think uh, when I'm in urban environments in Latin America, I tend to want, you know, 100% of my attention to be fixed on where I'm going and what's going on around me. Um, um, yes, I think this kind of a game at least gives you a chance to actually reflect deeply on those matters of where you play it. And I think that's important. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Taya? Yeah, I, I, so thanks for a very interesting talk. I didn't realize um, there were games that actually forced you to get up and go outside like this one. And one thing I was particularly intrigued about is you said the game, like there's no way of winning or losing in that sense, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's more of a, an awareness game in that sense. Yeah. Um, have there been any studies, like kids nowadays are so used to um, doing something to get a reward of some kind, you know, whether that's like this extra Pokemon or, or points or a chest or, I mean, I know gamification in our household is definitely a big thing, especially with the male part of the family <laughs> like getting the extra chest is yeah i got yeah. it today and that kind of stuff so and the in-app do... purchases yeah yeah so uh, we uh, i think our family hasn't gone that far so it's still all just you know doing it by by playing it and not actually buying your merits but how how do um kids who play those games how do you know how they react what it does with them because they don't get that gratification so how did it react to a game where there's no winning and losing? Yeah, I mean, this is the, the limiting factor, isn't it, of serious games, uh, is that if, uh, and, and the art game as well, because, because they push against so many of the basic presumptions of gaming as kids know it, um, they're likely to be highly disappointed by this kind of thing. And this is the only reason why their mother is interested in it. Um, you know, I mean, I there is no audience study um, that uh, that exists of who played um, Sin Sol, um, but I would suspect you know it's it's an entirely adult audience. Um, you know, um, what what would be really interesting is the stuff uh, that could be done um, to create games that push kids as far as the, the limits of their um, sort of comfort zone of what gaming do, because gaming does, um, because I do think it, it does tend to breed a kind of an instant reward or a very, yes, reward and extractivist kind of mentality. Um, and yeah, games that push just a little bit at those boundaries um, are probably the ones that are going to be most um, impactful with a younger younger audience. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking like in a in a um, in a school setting, for instance, you know, it will be something that people could try because they, I mean, okay, obviously there's the learning, but like if you want to get the awareness of like an ecological issue out there, for instance, that will be a nice way of getting people to under, especially kids, to understand these games that are not about you getting the most points or defeating, you know, your classmates, but it's about maybe building a shared vision of how things should be in the future or what's going to happen, you know, if, if we don't pay attention to certain things. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of thinking, is this being used in that way at all? Is it at the moment still more like a niche um, product in that sense? 
I'd say it's it's pretty niche. Um, mm. But I think um, probably if you were to, I mean, you would use this kind of game with obviously an old age group, you know, a sort of 17, 18 year old kind of age, age group, maybe down to 15 or 16. Um, but if you were to use it, it with that kind of an age group, um, I think you would probably not necessarily present it as a game. I think I might not even use that word. Um, and I would talk more about interactive narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. So just framing it differently. A, a story. Uh, it's a story mm -hmm. where you have to try and pick piece, you know, join the pieces together. Um, I think, you know, um, I mean, so, some games that kids play are based around narrative. Um, but it would probably be more helpful uh, to frame it for them as, you know, this is this is more part of your 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 English class than it is, um, you know, uh, playing games. Yeah, I agree. I think framing it in in a different way, making it more of an experience based thing than a game thing will probably help to um, have the right mindset if you would, would mm -hmm. use it in the educational setting. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's definitely I, very interesting. Yeah. I use another one of Misha Cardenas's um, works with a class that I teach on electronic literature. Um, so th they're all the, the comparative literature students. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, even, it's not a mobile phone app. It's something that you can um, do on your computer and it's, it works with sort of basically hypertext chunks um, as you, you know, take your options through the story. Um, and yeah, that, that's the framework for that. No one says game in any sense, although, you know, a, a choose your own adventure story is a, a game of some sort. Yeah, yeah, agreed. It's just how game is being used currently that doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Thanks. So, so uh, just to follow up on that, I was actually wondering if we need to rethink the the, the term game, right? So there, there are a lot of different games anyway, a board game, a card game. Um, this is, a, a, in a way, you can call it a game, but it's more, like you say, some sort of interactive story where you do the interaction by walking around. Um, but something like, like uh, a role-playing game is... Well, something like that without the electronic part, it's still a virtual world where you can walk around and there's no, not necessarily a, a way of winning, uh, although you can progress. Uh, and in that sense, it's the same as Pokemon Go. There's no winning, but you can progress. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. so is, is the aim, well, perhaps not in, in this game, but is the aim perhaps to just explore the world and then you can share with others, you know, I found this in the... Yes. in the game did you already see that or um yeah. so does this require so, I mean, a rethinking of game yes and no part of me thinks that she's uh, used the word game when she's put it up on the the app store because you know because when you put things on the app store you have to fit into pre-formatted mm. categories don't you and if you're thinking of trying to perhaps by accident get someone to click on it um well, yes, they might be disappointed that it's not a, a winning and losing kind of a game, but they might still have downloaded it and played it a bit. So something's perhaps game, gained, even though it's through disappointment. But there is a genre of art games that is the walking simulator, the environmental narrative game. And gamers, even your kind of, you know, youth... Um, winning or losing kind of gamers do know that there is a kind of game that is about exploring space. That that's that's what it is. It's not a winning or losing or shooting game. Yeah. No, I, I think that is yeah. It's interesting. It's but really something. The, the, the to word think game about. is fabulous. Um, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> polysemic. Yeah, uh, Benicio. Yes. Uh, thank you, Thea. Okay, so for somebody who grew up with games and collecting and hoarding and having upgraded armor and all that. Um, I think it's only just also a comment um, going into what Tanya said about, you know, not having rewards. I think what this um, 
yeah, let's use the word game, also sidesteps. And I think what needs to be highlighted is that um, possible psychological sense of loss when you either didn't save or somebody hacked your account and stole all your treasure. Like, I think there's a psychological um, permanent stress of somebody stealing your stuff. Like when you're not logged in and somebody come raid your castle or, or, you know, and I think that psychological sense of loss is the same as physically in the real world, losing something. So mm -hmm. it also eliminates that thing of you can't have anything. So you can't lose anything. It's not really about having and losing and fighting and getting and, you know, conquering mm -hmm. and all that. So I, yeah, I think it's a, it's a different way of thinking about also being in a gamed environment uh, in a sense, but not stressing about somebody coming to raid your treasure or hack your account and take everything because you didn't lock everything, something like that. So I just yeah. wanted to highlight that. I think if you can take away that loss uh, yes. stress from somebody, it also <laughs> helps with yes. enjoyment. Um yeah. And we've all dealt with children crying their eyes out because yes. someone has been onto Minecraft and destroyed all their stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm yes. one of those children, so yeah, just... <laughs> yes. um, yeah, what I think, I, I, I agree. Um, what would be also interesting with this kind of game is, of course, this is a single-player game. It would be really interesting if it could be multiplayer, but without that kind of... Uh, well, could you have a multiplayer environment without uh, the potential for people doing horrid things to each other? I don't know. Mm. Um, but it's a, that's a really good question. I was actually, well, I, I still had a, a, a last question uh, kind of in this line. So um, we, we showed how to play it on the more. Um, I was actually wondering, so does, I, I think I know the answer, but I still like to ask, does the game take any of the kind of real environment properties? And it, so that, that can be the location, but it can also be, for example, the time of the year, or if you play it at night, it might do something different, right? So then you get an interaction of, between the real environment and the virtual environment. Certainly some, some tech can, obviously. Um, so when I, uh, but this one doesn't. Um, mm. So when I started doing this, because I am not techie in any, and, and, and I don't play games, um, I went and sat down with a colleague who's in media and communication who knows all about this stuff. And I said, look, Tom, you please download the app and tell me all about it. Tom gets a thanks here um, because he did. Uh, and then we went to the pub and um, he told me what tech was being used and and you know what that meant so yes of course you can get far more sophisticated augmented reality applications that do respond so so that the the plants sort of hover well they, they, they kind of float around in a way that they've been pre-programmed pre to do so they're more or less towards the bottom part of the screen but a more sophisticated ar application could ensure that they permanently sort of locate themselves Mm -hmm. where you know where you're going to see them sort of sitting on the ground regardless of whether that's you know raised ground or you know whatever um so i think i mean this the thing with you know independently made art games is that you know they have access to finances that is way 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 uh, less than what you would be pouring into a mainstream yeah. kind of game um, and therefore, you know, not not everything can can be done. Um, yeah, I, I, the more I look at this game, I see it as a, a kind of an experiment. Um, but you know, with, without without massive investment, um, mm -hmm. and you could do all sorts of different things if you had a bit more money. Yeah, yeah, cool. No, thank you. Thank you so much. I see that we're kind of running out of time and you warned me that you still had uh, needed some time for traveling as well. Um, but thank you very much for a really interesting presentation and for a, a really nice discussion uh, at the end. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure.